let's just look at the conclusions again now that we've updated the last 20 years. You can say that the prior conclusions were correct, but that complete and social recovery are more clearly related now to the local economy even than in the first of recovery from schizophrenia. So let's have a look at how it could be that there's a relationship. Um, let's ask why did outcome get worse in the United Kingdom in the last 20 years of the 20th century? Why did outcomes stay stable in the United States, which is sort of the same question? And are there effects on the social exclusion of people with psychosis when you get this kind of a picture developing? I'll just quickly show you some reviews of jailing of people with psychosis in the United Kingdom. For, for me, this is a dramatic picture. For, if you look at all these studies from 1965 on, routinely the, the proportion of people in jail and prison in, the, in Britain was 2% to 3%, until suddenly 1996 goes up to 5%, then 6%, and then in 1998, this outrageous finding of 7 to 10% of men, 40% of women, and in some circumstances, 20 plus percent of women in prison populations are people with psychosis. Um, this, this really is a dramatic change, which essentially follows on from the later phase of British deinstitutionalization, which I think we'll be able to see is uh, Britain copying the American uh, horror of discharging people from long-term hospital care to inadequate community care. Maybe I can get an argument about this. <laughs> Anne. I've heard it said when people are looking at these figures for the UK that what we're seeing there is a change in the way in which the medical services within our prison service have been identifying mental health and therefore we've just got better about identifying people with psychosis over this period of time. That's an argument I've heard, that we're looking no more than an increase in how effective the medical services are in prisons in diagnosing psychosis through time. That's certainly possible. We, we're not going to see it reflected in some of the other social exclusion studies. You'd have to argue that, that jail mental health services improve their capacity to recognize people who are severely mentally ill, but that there never was a problem like that with the homeless, for example, or with American jails and prisons, which is extremely unlikely. Because if we move along, you'll see that in the states there always has been an incredibly large number, uh, right from 1976 on, a large proportion of jail inmates uh, and prison inmates who suffer uh, from serious mental illness. So America has always been a horror. So what I've heard um, in relation to this is that in the US, you've always diagnosed more people as having schizophrenia than we have in the UK and elsewhere. And, but that would be true if we were looking at schizophrenia. We were looking at psychosis, and I deliberately looked at psychosis because um, of that very problem that people don't look closely enough at the actual diagnosis of people in, in, in jail. But, and they talk about serious mental illness, and they can mean a hundred things, including severe personality disorders, and they can talk about schizophrenia. But if you look, choose psychosis, you're getting something that is more comparable in those studies. I was just thinking, isn't there an argument as well from the cultural perspective and how more black males are diagnosed or end up being in prison? And if you think of the history of black people in Britain compared to America, there's obviously been more black people in America a longer period of time than in Britain. That's a very good point. Uh, and it's certainly true that in the States that the incarceration rate is amazingly high anyway and it's uh, the rate of incarceration essentially follows the proportion of the population in that state which is black. Uh, are there more black males in Britain in the last 20 years of the 20th century would be my question. And the answer is probably yes. Is that true? Yeah. So there you go. Good, good, good suggestion. Uh, we'd also have to apply to the women because there was a dramatic increase in the proportion of women who are in jail, and as we'll see shortly, who are homeless. Maybe they're black women, I don't know, but uh, it certainly would be a different argument from the black male one. If we look at the homeless, uh, there always have been an incredible number of homeless in the United Kingdom, of me mentally ill homeless in the United Kingdom. 
no dramatic change there. When we finally start counting women amongst the homeless, it's a phenomenally high figure, but there's not enough studies there to give much thought to. So this is people with schizophrenia, this is people with psychosis, but always very high in Britain. Uh, and that's the trend line for those figures for what it's worth. If you look in the States, always incredibly high, but coming down actually in recent years. Now the argument here and is that we got better in actually recognizing who had schizophrenia and who had psychosis in those more epidemiologically precise studies of the homeless that were conducted in the States in the latter years. And that may well be true. The trend line though looks like that. So that's one of them, hell of a good improvement in one's research methodology to produce a trend line of that sort. So possibly the improvements uh, in psychosocial rehabilitation in the States in this period did actually have some impact or possibly some other innovations to do with uh, housing or uh, income support for people with mental illness led to a reduction in the number of homeless mentally ill in the States. I'm glad to be able to put this in the past tense now because what was happening with mental health in Britain in, during the 90s, I think, was not good. And what's happening since then is good. And so I think we, one can look at this little bit of history as if it's not quite us. But many people here were working in mental health. Who was working here in mental health during the 90s? Because you could give me an argument about what I'm going to be saying here. But if we look at service system issues, these are the kinds of things that people talked about in the journals that were happening in Britain as deinstitutionalization advanced rather dramatically during these years in the United Kingdom. Hospital closures without community programs, failure to establish a sort of community treatment, poor continuity of care after acute hospital treatment, shortage of residential alternatives, homelessness of inpatients, deficient vocational services, essentially replicating the American tragedy of the 60s in chucking people out of hospital without adequate services. Any, any of those people who worked in, the, in mental health in the 90s want to comment on, on this? Is, is this an accurate picture of, of uh, what was happening then? Completely accurate. <laughs> hey, large on that. <laughs> All right. So, um, so that's what's happening at the service system level, but what's happening at the macro, social, and policy level? We could look for various ways of explaining why things got bad then in Britain. We're just taking that as an example, looking at the general theme, but taking Britain during that period as a way of looking at it. Economic disincentives to employment is one thing that, that got greater during that period of time and made it more difficult for people to work. Economic stress or high unemployment affects people with schizophrenia adversely, though to put it another way, more positively, work helps people recover from schizophrenia. And if you've got high unemployment, they ain't gonna get work and they ain't gonna get better. Now this one is harder to look at. Reduced demand for labor negatively affects rehabilitative efforts. But the fact that there weren't really good vocational programs during that period reflects, I think, the fact that why would you have good vocational programs when there really isn't any work for people? And the last one we can look at very easily, poor funding for health and social care. Uh, did we just stop much spending money on mental health? The answer is no. Bob Glover, who's a, a British researcher, helped me pull these figures together. This is per capita national health service spending on mental illness and mental health services in England and Wales. In England, they're discontinuous because you change how the data is collected, but essentially through none of these periods is there a decrease in spending from 1959 through the last years of the century. And if we look at per capita local authority spending on community care for mental illness in England in constant pounds, uh, again, actually dramatic increase in spending on community care, naturally, because you're moving people out of hospital. It's not decreased funding. So I can show you figures from various countries through various periods of time. They all show the same thing. When the economy gets bad and care gets worse, we spend more on mental health. I can show you that for Canada and Colorado and so on and so forth. So that's, that's a constant. So that's not the explanation. It takes us back to these other ones. Uh, so let's start looking at some of these explanations like economic disincentives to employment, work helps people recover from schizophrenia, and we can't really look at 
this one about do we, do we stop working on rehabilitation when there's no employment. So let's take a look at this issue, which I think is vitally important for us all, the question of economic disincentives to employment. I must admit to a certain amount of irritation going to various countries and hearing people talking about recovery and hearing people talking about working closely and advocating for service users, etc. And then when you ask them, well, now how does your disability pension system work here? The workers say, oh, oh I, I don't know. You'd have, to ask, um, you'd have to ask somebody at the disability pension office. We really need to know uh, just what are the economic facts of life of people with serious mental illness that we're working with. Uh, and in the United States, I'll just very briefly tell you, there are two disability support systems, which makes it nice from the research point of view. There's one, SSI, which is more disincentivizing, where as soon as you're earning 65 to 85 dollars, which is 32 to 42 quid a month, then you start losing 50 cents on the dollar. So you get basically you're paying you pay, you get earning at a minimum wage, and you're getting taxed at a 50% tax rate on that. And if you've got a rent subsidy, you're paying an additional tax on that. So you end up earning about a couple of dollars an hour. Well, if you're lucky, a dollar and a half an hour. And that's what you're taking home when you start to work. So it doesn't make much sense. The one which does make more sense to work is SSDI, uh, where the earnings disregard is $800 you could earn per month or 400 pounds, and then you lose everything. Well, everybody so goes out and they earn $799 a month, a year in and year out, and it actually works quite well. And everybody works part-time, which isn't a terribly bad thing. And then occasionally people say, oh, OK, well, I'll go to work full-time, and they do it. But most people just continue to work part-time. And that actually is one of the least disincentivizing of the plans here. Australia, um, after you earn 95 quid, you st it's sort of like SSI, you lose 50 cents on the dollar. In Britain at that time, I was told that if you earned that much, 312 quid a month for six months, then you lost everything. Is that still relatively speaking true? In capacity benefit, I think it's about £88 a week now, so it's not that much different. But on a, a income support, the other key benefit is only £20 a week. And you've also got the 65% for housing benefit and 20% tapers for council tax benefit, i.e. you lose 85% of uh, any extra pound. Yeah. So it's actually, if you look at the entire package... You've got to be crazy to work, basically. So that's the UK. This is, this is not a good system. But if you were to change that so you don't lose all your pension, but you can hang on to that much money, then it would look closer to the US SSDI business. So that, that's the sort of change that, that politicians should be looking at if they really want to see outcomes improve. Now, there are some countries that where the disincentive is very low in Italy. Uh, only 80% of, only, only if you are 80% disabled do you get a pension. So a lot of people with serious mental illness don't get a pension in, in Italy. The only reason it works is that nearly everybody with serious mental illness lives with their family and the family supports them. And the other reason it, there's not much disincentive is that they ignore the rules anyway. And um, people go to work on the, on the black market, as they call it. They work on the beaches of Rimini in the summer and whatever, and work on the farms. And so basically they just have a glorious disregard for the whole system. In Greece, pension is so low that you actually can earn more by work, taking a minimum wage job. There are many systems which, for one reason or another, are not disincentivizing that we can't copy. Well, I suppose you could copy, well, you can't, we can't copy the Italian system because in Bologna, I think something like 80-some percent of people with serious mental illness are living with their families. Well, that's not the situation here, so you can't copy that. But you could copy uh, something more like the US SSDI system. So let's see how this works itself out. In fact, this is the latest study of supported employment conducted in six countries just recently published in The Lancet at the end of last year. And what it shows is that employment is limited by the disincentives to employment and the pension system in the various countries. So they rated uh, two of the six countries as high in what they call the benefits trap disincentives, London, Britain, and the Netherlands. They rated 
uh, two of their sites as medium or low. That's Ulm in Germany and Zurich in Switzerland in terms of the benefits trap. And they rated Italy as having no disincentives and also Bulg Bulgaria as having no disincentives. And if you look at the effect of supported employment, this is just a statistical figure, it won't mean much, but basically here the effect of supported employment and getting people to, back to work is much greater than in the high disincentives countries. So this is, uh, has a very real effect in obstructing what we try to do in the way of rehabilitation. So now let's return to looking at the issue of work improves outcome in schizophrenia, which is the other big issue that we want to look at. Is it, does work actually help people get better if they have schizophrenia? We've got some evidence of that that we've looked at already. We've got, well, we haven't looked at this, but this was a book that was written by Harvey Brenner in the States that showed over a century that increasing admissions uh, that the admissions of people with mental illness to hospital increased during an economic slump routinely and over the period of decade after decade. And it's specifically uh, adults of working age uh, that this happens with. It doesn't happen with children. It doesn't happen with the elderly. So there's some indication you're more likely to get, end up getting admitted to hospital if you have a mental illness if unemployment is high. We've seen on the data that I showed you today that outcomes worse in the Great Depression. You've seen that outcome was better in the United Kingdom during the labor shortage years than in the shortage of, of employment. And outcome is better in third world villages, is something that I'll show you shorter, shortly. And outcome is better for better educated people in the developed world and the worse educated in the developing world. So you've got a, an, a flip of the usual uh, gradient for outcome in schizophrenia that in the developed world, the people who have more education have a better outcome. In the third world, the people who have less education have the better outcome. And this really doesn't make much sense unless you figure that where people are uh, employed in subsistence agriculture at the village level, uh, they're more likely to be able to return to work than if they're in paid employment. So people who are less well-educated more likely to be subsistence agriculturalists. And that may also help explain one of the reasons why outcome is better in third world villages than elsewhere in the world. So at this point, I'm gonna go on and take a look at uh, outcome in the developing world. First major study was a prevalent study, not an incident study. So it just uh, took people coming into centers around the world, initiated in 1968. Nine countries around the world, some in the developed world, some in the developing world. Dramatically better outcome in the developing world. 35% of people in the best outcome category, only 13% in the worst outcome category, which is a reverse of the figures you're seeing for the developed world. These are developing world countries here, places like India and Colombia and Taiwan. Then there's a much more important study, which was an incident study where they tried to detect all the people who develop a psychotic illness based on talking to key informants over a period of time and follow those people for initially two years and now many more years than that. And also discovered that if you basically capture everybody who uh, has a psychotic illness, in the developed world, you see still much worse outcome, 37%, compared to 63% of people who are in the best outcome category in the developing world. And now we have a nice new study, which is just published. This is also called Recovery from Schizophrenia, but it's not by me. This is the, uh, an analysis of several different cohorts of people from um, countries around the world, which has been pulled together by a WHO team. And I'll show you some data from essentially decades of follow-up, 12 to 26 years of follow-up from 16 centers around the world. They're looking at the, the, the pre prevalence cohort, which is that pilot study of schizophrenia that I showed you, uh, the 10 country study is the determinants of outcome of severe mental disorders. Then another WHO study, reduction assessment of psychiatric disability. Another study from uh, Madras or Chennai in India. Another from Hong Kong. And here's a prevalent study from Beijing. But you notice, and what do they find? Uh, again, uh, dramatically, this is global assessment of functioning. This means the, the bigger the figure, if it's 71 or higher, means you're functioning at a high level. And the people who are functioning at that level are high in India, these 
three uh, Indian sites, uh, Kali, Colombia, Chennai in India, Beijing is intermediate, and then Dublin, Honolulu, and Rochester, all at the bottom end of the outcome table. Uh, this is in terms of global assessment of functioning, and here, uh, Bloiler symptoms of recovery, again, substantially greater in general in the uh, third world settings. Now, there are obviously many explanations for, for that, um, but you can look at whether there's a relationship to the employment rate of those subjects. And if we look at a very s strict way of looking at employment, employment rates greater for developing world patients, full-time paid employment for the past two years, uh, substantially greater in the Indian setting. Interestingly, the paid employment is greater in the urban setting in Chandigarh. In the rural setting, paid employment obviously is less because a lot of people are paid for subsistence work, but the actual employment rate, for example, of housekeeping work uh, is substantially better also in that setting than in the urban setting. Uh, and again, uh, the, this employment rate is substantially higher in the developing world. When you get down into Dublin, 13%, Honolulu, 23%, which is, seems very high, Rochester, 25%. In general, you don't expect employment rates for people with serious mental illness in the developed world these days to be more than about 15 to 20 percent. So here's uh, an Indian author attributing this to the lack of disincentives created by disability benefits. And if you look at what proportion people in, those, in that study are actually getting disability benefits, of course it's virtually none in the developing world. And well, it's only 40 to 50 percent, which seems quite low. Uh, for people in the developed world. So there's some kind of a relationship developing here between um, the disability support system, the availability of work, the kind of work that's available, and whether people with psychosis, with schizophrenia, recover in these studies. But obviously that's only a, a fraction of the discussion we could have about why people with schizophrenia have a better outcome in the developing world. Anybody want to offer other suggestions for, for the better outcome in the developing world? Yeah, one argument was um, the belief system and how family and friends and those of those in those areas actually believe what the individual is saying. So if they were saying that the difficulties they were having or the things that they were seeing or hearing um, came from, say, an ancestor or whatever, they're more likely to believe we're here or in countries like Britain, it wasn't necessarily believed. Um, I think that's certainly true, that especially early in the illness, then somebody's likely to blame a source from outside the family or the person, which we don't do in the first world these days, but they might blame witchcraft or evil eye or something of that sort. What psychiatrists from around the world will tell me is, oh, but don't fool yourself into thinking that stigma is any less for people with serious mental illness in the third world. And I think that is actually true as well, that once a person maybe becomes more of a liability, more, has more of a chronic illness, then uh, the stigma can be very great and the treatment can be very harsh. Yet I think you have to distinguish between people who've got late in the course of their illness compared to those who are early in the course of their illness. In, in which setting, in which case, I think your comment's spot on.